Welcome to Gear Vlogs Automotive Podcast, a hybrid call-in talk show where you, the viewer or listener of the Gear Vlogs YouTube channel, can tune in and listen to the latest in automotive news and happenings within the automotive space. I'm Mario Gear. Want to be a part of the show? It's easy. Just call our show voicemail hotline at 805 805- 419-5129 any time of the day of the week before the following Thursday and leave a message or please follow us on the Clubhouse app. Become a member of the Gear Vlogs Gearheads Club on Clubhouse and raise your hand to come on stage and be a part of the community when we go live most nights starting at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. So sit back, relax, and crack open the cold one. All right, my guest is Rick Sadler, is the CEO and founder of RMS Media Group, a luxury media publishing company that is owned and operated a niche publications, including luxury pools in outdoor living, ocean homes, uh, North Shore Magazine, as well as luxury media buying and consulting business. Rick's experience covers over 30 years of management and executive position in luxury publishing industry. Rick joined Rob Report Magazine in 1984 as a commissioned sales rep and became an associate publisher, publisher, senior VP over the span of 17 years. RMS Media Group launched several successful niche market publications including Moves Magazine, OT Magazine for Professional Athletes, Our Publishing Services Division has exclusive agreements with numerous custom publications that serve affluent market including official owner publications for jaguar mercedes lexus ferrari bentley austin martin and bugatti to just name a few welcome rick thank you great to be here mario thank you um i first heard you give a speech a few weeks ago that caught my interest and i knew you had a treasure trove of stories to tell and for that reason, I just had to get you on. Um, what would you consider your first luxury purchase would be, let's, since you're in the luxury publishing business? You know, just let me start off, you know, break the ice, so to speak. Sure, yeah. Well, um, I think uh, my first purchase was probably, and I have to go way back, right? You yeah. just read off my bio how many years I've been in the business. I had to rattle my brain there. Um, I would say that the per, the first purchase, uh, was, uh, the most memorable and first that I can recall was a, uh, a Gerard Perigo watch. Um, it was, it was, uh, a watch that was being unveiled and I was actually speaking at an event. It was a sort of owners only event in California and Phil Hill was the, uh, was the guest as well. Because he, of course, uh, used to uh, race the uh, the Ferrari 250, right? And so that was the uh, that was the limited edition watch that was being unveiled. And so because I met him, because I was at the event, fell in love with the watch, and and uh, and so that that one's uh, that one's one of my favorites still. Some some twenty something years later, absolutely love the watch, and I try to buy a watch or anything really when there's some history, some background to it. So that's it. That's the that's that's the first one. Okay, yeah, definitely interesting. I never quite got developed the watch bug, although I think it was a. It's probably not as uh, luxury as most, but one of the watchmakers made a licensed brand deal with the Blue Angels, and they have a nice series of watches there. I wish I could think of the brand name, but that's on my I list. Think it's- it's it's brightling right i believe so yeah but yeah it, this goes back to when i was a kid you know probably back during the i think the uh early 80s i think when they first came out with that series of watches and i saw it in the display store of a jewelry store somewhere and i said yeah someday i gotta yeah. get one <laughs> but, yep. that was my that was my second watch it wasn't the blue angel version but it, but uh i bought a uh i i bought a a brightling and uh and you know they they were also very popular just in general, uh, mm-hmm. but but they did have licensing uh, ar- arrangements with Blue Angels and, and and other companies too. But yeah, that's my number two. Funny you mentioned that. 
<laughs> cool. Okay, um, well, let's, let's see. Next question would be is, uh, I heard you had a story how about a Bugatti Royal owned by Ralph Lauren. Could you maybe elaborate a little bit more on that, that story? Sure. So um, a friend of mine I went to high school with, Carl Brown, he, um, I saw him once in our little town. He had a 72 Cuda, and uh, this was years after we both graduated. And it had that typical rust under the rear quarter. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the kind of rust that just eats out the whole back, so good, you know, yeah. in the trunk area. Right. Mud and, mud and water and everything collecting it would rust out. So he, he, we, had, we had cars that people used to be, uh, you know, really proud of that they, uh, that they parked, uh, you know, downtown. People would come by and talk about it. And he had his car there and it had the rust out there. And he looked at it and said, friends and I, and said, wow, that's a, that's a, that's a neat car. And he said, "Yeah, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta do the, the wheel wells." A couple of weeks later, we looked at the car. It looked like it came out of a, a factory. I said, no. "Carl, I can't believe it. That thing's beautiful." He said, "Yeah, well, you know, I just slapped a little mud on it, and uh, you know, it's not done right, but it looked pretty. It came out pretty good." We're thinking, it "Came out pretty good. The thing's perfect." And ten years later, I saw him at uh, Paul Russell and Company, a company that restores a lot of Mercedes and. Um, really the top 1% high-end cars. And I was given a tour there while I was at Rob Report, and and uh, there was there was uh, Carl Brown. He graduated from, you know, uh, working on uh, his own cars and some other things to uh, to working there. He had been there for a while. And, and the car that we were looking at in the shop, many magnificent cars, was, was this Bugatti. And so I said hello to Carl, uh, you know, after 10 years of not seeing him. And he said, yeah, I'm, I think he was the project lead on it. And um, he was tasked with getting this thing ready for the Concourse d'Elegance. And he said, we're really, we're really, this is a magnificent car. And we're really hoping that it wins, you know, best of show, 100%, uh, you know, 100-point restoration. And uh, she said, geez, you know, this, this thing is 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 a lot of work to be done and it's months away uh he said yeah yeah we we, we hope to finish it uh, we will finish it he said not hope we got to get this thing done and so he had uh drawings on the wall of uh various parts of the car i uh, you know he said there's only three of these things and this might be the only one that exists maybe one other so you you can't really buy parts you can't really you know go measure and copy things you just have to go by sketches and pictures and all that sort of thing so we had a big big sketch on a big major part of the car we're trying to use all the original parts when we can if not we make them and so i looked at the part that he was working on and they were literally banging the steel looking at pictures and drawings to put this thing together and uh it was amazing to see it and 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 then see it later at the uh, concourse and uh you know it won uh, best of show i believe and um became today still the most prized car uh, not only in Ralph Lauren's collection but I think in the world and I I believe it's the most valuable most expensive car on the planet and the interesting thing is Carl Brown uh, I'm sure among with many others there of course led by the by the owner Paul Russell nobody knows Carl Brown no nobody nobody ever heard of him if you google him you won't find anything about him and it's just amazing that he had his hands on that car as the lead in that restoration and he just um never really uh boasted about it obviously never talked about it never used it for his his next gig when he opened his own restoration facility and i thought that was just fascinating um i read i read uh, a book years ago by by donald trump and somebody asked him why why do you name everything trump and he told a story about a bridge opening in Manhattan and the person, the architect that was responsible for everything having to do with the look of it, the design, the construction. And the ceremony, when the bridge opened and when they snipped the ribbon, they mentioned everyone in you know, City Hall, everyone had to do with the, the, the uh, New, York, New York City development, the mayor and everyone was there. And they forgot to mention this guy's name. And he said, for that reason, nobody's going to forget what I got my hands on. I'm going to call it Trump. And so 
I, I thought of that story when I thought of Carl Brown. It had, 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 had everything to do with the restoration, and he, he was just never mentioned. You can't find him anywhere. So that's my little story about uh, – sure, it's a personal story, but I think somebody like that is sad to me that uh, his accolades aren't known. Yeah, and I definitely – I'm a firm believer in giving credit where credit is due. That's I'm a firm believer on that. And, you know, it's like you – when somebody has that type of skills – you want to promote them because they can teach us. We, you know, you can be the next generation of, you know, metal beater, and they may want to contact them, pick their brains, apprentice with them, and mm. and unfortunately, you know, it's a it's a dying art the, of uh, as coach builders, restor restoration experts, artists, whatever you want to call them, and yeah. uh, you know, everybody thinks that you need a four year plus degree or an MBA or whatever, you know, to get well in life when you know, my philosophy is, hey, guess what? We still need ditch diggers too. Yeah, right. Well it's not it's it's no fault of uh of uh, the restoration facility. It's no fault of uh Carl. He was uh, kind of a quiet kid. He never really you know, probably wanted any kind of limelight or exposure. But mm -hmm. uh, when I think of that restoration and when I think of uh, how beautiful that car is and how well-known it is, when I think of how it got to be this magnificent restoration, of course, the heritage of it and the history of it and all that is, is, is of course, in large part because it's so rare. But the actual beauty of it, when you look at it, who did this, is not known. So it's... Um, it's 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 too bad because he's he passed away about ten years ago and uh, you know his his uh, connection to that will uh, will never be known unless of course people listen to this and they hear my story right right exactly and uh, uh, maybe um, you know we can uh, if you have any other stories on Carl I don't know I'm just throwing it out there maybe we can uh, highlight those stories in the future so something to yeah. Do something to think about or maybe if you know people who knew him who also had stories we could turn this into a thing and uh at least try to keep his name and memory alive uh on the internet yeah yeah it's true i i, I do know that he started a company he asked he called me and asked if i could help him uh, promote it and he passed away a few years later and his partner i believe is still running it so you know, just thinking about preparing to talk with you today, I was thinking about him and, and his story, and I, I kind of looked up what I could find, and uh, I'm going to reach out and talk to him and uh, and see uh, see if uh, my recollection is exactly how I recall it and find out a little bit more information. So we'll be in touch. Oh, definitely. Cool. Uh, let's see. What else do I can I ask you? Um, well, honestly, based on your luxury publishing career over the years, I'm sure you've probably met a lot of people. Any of them stand out? Any one in particular stood stood out more than the others? You know, it's it's really fun to uh, be to, to to be a kid, and 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 I I joined uh, Rob Report at I think twenty one, twenty two years old. So you, you know, I thought I was a big adult, but I look back now as just a kid. And so you know, for the next several years, anyone that I met, of course, my passion is always uh, you know cars, luxury and exotic cars. And so anyone I met just just kind of was a was a big thrill for me. And, you know, my job was to was to sell advertising and and run a sales group that that would sell advertising. And in, in the early days, we had a uh, a section in the back, a listing section where people would do photograph uh, advertisements for their classic and vintage cars. Every now and then, I'd find somebody really interesting as I was cold calling out of newspapers to find cars and explain to them that the newspaper wasn't really the audience and this was a group where millionaires and billionaires read the magazine to buy through it and find cars like the ones you know that I was calling on and then I would attend shows and events and uh and and and, and every now and then meet somebody that you know I thought was pretty fascinating um one of the most interesting uh was to learn about Jerry Weigard who who uh who invented the Vector automobile. Do you remember that back yep. in the 80s? Oh, definitely remember it. Um, but go on. <laughs> yeah, he, he you know, he was trying to create um, an automobile that would compete with Ferrari and Lamborghini made here in the USA. 
And, uh, you know, he worked, I think, for one of the big three for a while and cut his teeth and developed it. But he, I think his answer to why didn't you work there, stay there was, you know, he didn't want to be a yes man. You know, he wanted to go out on his own, do whatever he wanted. But of course, in doing that, being, uh, you know, a fantastic uh, engineer and having that kind of background doesn't always mean you have the money. So unfortunately, his car... Uh, which uh, was fantastic looking, um, did rival uh, the uh, the other exotics, uh, had uh, tried to outdo it as well. So, you know, it had Kevlar steel exterior. It had 600-something horsepower engine. He boasted about the, the speed and the acceleration and the quality, you know, aircraft parts that made up the engine. But uh, he never had enough money. And uh, I think over time, and never really produced uh, enough cars. I think he sold a couple of them in the beginning, and they were like $400,000. So I was talking with him about advertising and promoting, and he placed ads, and we'd see each other at car shows. And he, uh, he, he claimed to have three or four. At least he wanted to make the impression that he had three or four on hand and that his production line was moving, and that was the biggest criticism. Everyone thought... You know, he only had one car and he couldn't sell any cars. And people were a little skeptical of, you know, should I buy this car? So the the, the rumor was that uh, he would go to various shows and he would paint the car different colors for the next show to make it appear like it was a new car or a different car. And uh, some of the, the experts were saying, oh, it was a white one. The next couple of months now it's going to be a blue one. And... Um, but when he had it road tested, he, he he claimed at one point it was a 200 mile an hour car, but it was never really tested. I think Road and Track did a test, and they were blown away with the uh, with a quarter mile and zero to sixty. And I I think uh, they said it was the fastest one they've ever tested. So the car looked beautiful, looked magnificent. It um, it drove uh, well. It was fast. It had all of the right things. He just didn't have enough money. And he got into a situation in the early 90s where a company called Megatech uh, bought a controlling interest in it. And they, I, I believe, owned uh, Lamborghini at the time. And uh, he lost his majority stake in the company, and they fired him. Um, you just can't imagine somebody that, that's his life's dream to build this car and he was in a situation where they, they removed him as CEO. He was ousted. So he he, uh, he locked up his factory and hired security. And they were banging on the door to get him out of there. And he called me on the telephone. Yeah, I, I need you to do something. Uh, you know, t- tell the world. Write something about me. We, I'm, 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 uh, This isn't right. And I could hear banging on the door. And he's under his desk, you know, calling me on the telephone. And, uh, you know, as, 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 uh, you know, a kid dreaming about cars, thinking I found myself in this situation where Jerry Weigert's calling me on the telephone while people are banging on the door trying to get him out because he just, uh, he just got fired. I, I probably one of the first few to know about it because he called me and I picked up the phone. He was calling everyone he could think of, but he ultimately, um, you know, because it, it was a, a situation where he, he didn't have, he, he, he was legally voted out. He wound up outside of his own car company. And I believe he sued and got back the name and he started up again. But the sad thing about Jerry Weikart is, uh, and it's almost a case study for, you know, when should you give up, right? Mm-hmm. He, he died uh, a year ago, roughly, still talking about building the next version of the Vector. Never really, maybe half a dozen cars exist, three or four, um, but he never launched this car, which he worked his entire adult life to try to produce. So, you know, it's an interesting story for me because I was a part of it, but also a sad one because you never like to see somebody put their whole career into something they believe in and never have it, you know, officially get launched and, and begin producing cars. So that was that was that was that was a memorable experience. I will I will never forget. Uh, you're definitely incredible. I remember hearing uh, it was like the CEO of uh, uh, I think it was a Paul Mitchell hair product lines in the salons. 
I remember hearing, recalling him telling a story how he was driving his Vectory, he owned one at the time, and him and his daughter were coming back from Las Vegas, and his daughter had just gotten uh, her driver's license, so he puts her behind the wheel, and she's opening it up, and, you know, considering how fast the car is going, and he goes, yeah, she knows how to handle a car, and then next thing you know, He's uh, on a phone with, I think, asking Clinton Eastwood. He said, yeah, I'm going to buy her her first uh, vehicle. I'm going to get her one of these uh, uh, GMC uh, Cyclones. And Eastwood says, do you know how fast that truck is? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that was, that was a funny story. So. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, small world. Uh... And obviously, I know you've met a few other people, um, but maybe we could save that for another time. Uh, but there was a story or something I think you had mentioned about a you helped find someone a three hundred gold wing. Yeah, um, the uh, so so one one of the the the, the absolute rules to working for Rob Report and, and finding cars that were for sale. Um, one, one of the, the rules for, for everyone involved was that you could never um, take any, any commissions. You never, you never take uh, uh, any money on a side money or putting deals together because obviously they wanted the car to be advertised and not you sort of make contacts and, 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 and line your own pocket. So um, there was a, uh, person that called on a 300 gullwing and it was uh a car that was in terrific shape you know one of those rare finds the dream finds it wasn't quite a bar find it was just some a barn find it was just something that somebody had kept in really good condition for you know over the years and so i said well do you want to advertise i'm sure it will sell what do you want for it he said seventy five thousand. i said wow that's uh that's a good price um, so I called a uh, person I knew that was uh, working in the business of specifically uh, restoring and buying and selling those cars. And I believe he was also working for Paul Russell uh, Restoration Company that did the Bugatti. So uh, I said, are you interested in this? He said, yes, of course I am. And I said, well, <clears throat> you know, I can't take any money, but uh, it's what you what I think it is as good as I think it is, I know you're going to want to buy this car based on how he's described it to me. You just, uh, you know, you keep placing ads for your company and, uh, I don't want anything from it. Can't take anything from it. Are you sure? Are you, are you, are you sure? Because if this is what you say it is, this is an absolute steal. So I tried to call him a few hours later to find out, Hey, did you talk to him? What happened? It's as good as I think it is. And uh, the person answered his phone. Uh, the uh, assistant said, "Oh, he's uh, he's on he's on a plane going to Washington." So he <laughs> literally dropped everything, hopped on a plane, bought a ticket, and flew out and purchased it. And it was magnificent. So uh, all I can think of was uh, I was I was grateful to, to to make somebody's day and help put together that sale. I just wish that I had bought the car. <laughs> Thinking, thinking what that car is valued at right now. It was, it was, it was, it was priced well to, for him to make a good, a good buck back then. But, um, boy, do I wish uh, I had. On, on the list of things I wish I had done was that was buying that car directly. Wow, it's similar to a, not as probably as good a story as yours, but one story I was told to me was this gentleman heard the story, I guess it was told to his father, but the story goes, this is out here on the West Coast in California, there was a gentleman who worked for a soda distributing company, basically delivering soda to grocery stores and such, and one of his counts, it was like a small mom-and-pop grocery type store, but sometimes the owner would not be at the store, so the gentleman would have to go out to her home to, you know, pick up a check. So one day he's mm -hmm. there, and he notices, you know, the garage is slightly open. He's looking at the car and he goes, uh, what's the story by, you know, the, uh, the Mercedes in the garage? And he, he goes, oh, it was something my husband owned before he was shipped off to Vietnam. And 
Obviously, the husband never came back, so it just sat in the garage. So, whatever, they struck up a deal. He eventually came, bought the car, then brought it back, got it running, got it registered. And then next thing you know, somebody else noticed that he has the car, made him at back at, during the time, made him an offer he couldn't refuse because it was enough for him to be able, at that time, to buy his own first home. So he goes, he bought his first home. But a few years later forward, he gets a phone call from Mercedes-Benz North America because they did a title search and they go, we noticed that you uh, had registered this particular Mercedes. He goes, uh, yeah, but I sold it. He goes, why? He goes, oh, it happens to be a rare factory option gold wing race car that we'd like to acquire for our museum. Oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, and after that, I don't know what happened to the story. I don't know if Mercedes continued trying to find where that car went or if they did a search or who knows what happened to the car after he sold it, if he had the contact information of the last person he sold it to, all of that stuff. So that's one of those great yeah. mysteries and maybe throw it out there. Maybe somebody out there knows this story. They can call in and fill in the blanks that they know the, the continuation of that story. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if there's any more of those stories left or if they've uh, all been pulled out of the barn and have been discovered and, People, uh, their family, their wives, or their kids or grandkids well, wanted to sell it for whatever money, for whatever reason. You, you, you know, you, you, you know, the old uh, Ferraris that people thought were gone, or the Mercedes. Who knows? I always find those stories interesting, though. Uh, true. It's like um, my friend David Hamburger of um, Specialty Vehicle Engineering. He told me a story once where he knew he knew that Chip Boost had a, a Gold Wing. Mercedes in his collection or a horde of cars that he was looking for a project car for him and his dad to, you know, restore together. So he was contacted trying to see if Chip would sell it to him. He goes, Dave, you don't want this car. It's like, I'd have too many hours into it, restoring it. You could better off. I could build you a replica based on, on a Chrysler 300 or something or chassis or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do what mm -hmm. Chip does. So he goes, but he goes, yeah, thanks anyway, but yeah, looking for a more project or something that my dad and I can do together, you know? So, uh -huh. yeah, you hear about those stories, and, you know, I guess what it boils down to who you know, you know, what kind of projects you want to look for. It's like a local land speed, hot rodder, Bonneville salt flat racer type uh, gentleman that's, yeah. you know, in my neighborhood who was actually a client back when I was a technician. He winds up telling me one day, he goes, Hey, did you hear about that uh, 32 Ford all-steel car that uh, recently was in the neighborhood that got sold? He goes, I goes, what 32 Ford? Yeah, it was right by, <laughs> over there by that Denny's. He goes, there was a 32 Ford. Literally, he's describing where the block next over to my house is. <laughs> I'm like going, really? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm kicking myself for not having the uh, guts to walk <laughs> knock on the door of the gentleman and say, would you be interested in selling that car? <laughs> yeah, that's sometimes that's how somebody gets it, right? Yeah. They do They do enough snooping and uh, make uh, the bold move of banging on doors and asking and every now and then, you know, you, you probably hear a lot of, no, I'm not going to sell that, but uh, every now and then you have, yeah, you know what? What do you give me for it? It's been sitting there for a while. Exactly. Um, I, I just hope there's some more of those stories out there. They're always fun to hear. Exactly. Um, is there any uh, other questions that you think I may have forgotten to ask that you? Uh... Well, I, I, um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing you figured out by now. I probably have a bunch of stories to tell, right? So <laughs> we could probably go on throughout the uh, the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> yeah, we could. But, but uh, you know, one of my favorite uh, favorites. Uh, events, I guess, uh, was uh, getting invited to both the Ferrari factory and, and the Lamborghini factory. And um, at the time, we had, uh, in, the, in the early 90s, we had uh, formed a relationship with the CEOs of, of both companies in the U.S., and we got the invite to go to the Lamborghini and Ferrari. And, and the Ferrari factory they opened it up for us to get a tour and it was during the production of the F50 
and there was a blackout, which I didn't really know what the term meant, but it was explained to me that when they're building a new car and it's the secretive early stages where there are no no photographs from any of the magazines, they don't let anyone in. They close the factory. No one can come in unless the workers are there. And we got a special invite, so we're walking around and people are uh, more than once yelling at us, you know. In, in Italian, of course, I didn't understand, but you could tell by the look on their face, get out of here. You know, what is he doing here? Get him, leave. What are you, you know, they, they, they knew the rules, but the special invite broke those rules and we were allowed to go in as long as we didn't promise to uh, give out any secrets or take any pictures. So, but that was just an amazing experience to go into that Ferrari factory and, and, and hear from, you know, the people that are working on I can remember one one particular phase of of production was a father and son team that were working on the engine. This was a, you know, the best in the world kind of spent his whole life working at Ferrari and was very pleased. It was an honor to work for Ferrari and the fact that he got his son to come into the factory and work alongside of him, building the cars and learning from him. It was just fascinating, almost tears in his eyes, just telling the story about how proud he was to be able to, you know, sort of the best job in the world to be in here and working for Ferrari. It is the pride of the country. And it's, it was just a fascinating trip. And before that, we were at the Lamborghini factory. And uh, at the end of our, our um, uh, of course, we toured the factory and uh, we had lunch uh, with with uh, the CEO and all the, the rest of the workers. And, and the legendary uh test driver uh was was this man named Valentino Valentino Baldini and he uh, he dressed up in a Ferrari red Ferrari test drive suit with the most a magnificent set of of uh Italian loafers you've ever seen and he they basically just ran the place he did whatever the heck he wanted to do so they'd build a car he would test drive it he would come back he'd tell him what's wrong with it what has to be fixed what didn't feel right and so after our, our trip through the factory, he, would you like to take a, a ride in, in, in a Ferrari? Take, I'll take you for a ride. And um, he, he had that car. He pulled, he pulled uh, out, of the, out of the parking lot and, and took it on a road. It was just a two-lane uh, road. It was very flat in the middle of nowhere. But... Uh, he had that. I, I looked at the speedometer. It was, it was in kilometers, but I think it was up to 260 kilometers. He was going down the side road at 160 miles an hour, trying to pass people that were in his way. And the most amazing thing that that five five part harness, uh, you know, seatbelt system and, and everything, and the way he was driving, as crazy as it was, he'd pull out in the left lane, pull back in, and the car would zoom by, like we were seconds from from head on collisions, and he just. He drove it, and he was so comfortable driving it that uh, in any other circumstance, I'd be <clears throat> just incredibly scared, and yet I felt calm like he knew what he was doing. And uh, what a thrill of a lifetime. And then at the end of it, he took the car. He wanted to, he needed to park it to let me off on, on next to the curb, and he did a 180-degree uh, spin out, stepped on it, and he came almost perfectly lined up, six inches from the curb, both wheels, and just stopped after he spun the car 180 degrees, hopped out of the car, and you, you just you can't pay for an experience like that. It's just amazing. Sounds like you got the same uh, duplicate ride that I think it was uh, Maury Schaefer from uh, 60 Minutes uh, a few years back. He did a similar tour at the factory, and um, Valentino gave him a ride as well. So it sounds like I, I could just picture um, your story, picturing Maury Schaefer in on that sixty minute <laughs> special. I'm going, yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> did he? I wonder if he said, "I want the Rick ride." Yeah. Give, give me the Rick ride. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I didn't see that. I will have to. Uh, I will have to check that out. That will be fun to watch. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, it's I'll definitely. Bet he did get it's the all, same tour. Yeah, it's I'm, definitely. I'm sure I wasn't. It, yeah, it's probably on YouTube, right? I'm sure I wasn't the only one that got that ride, but for me, and as many people as I've 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 told that story, I haven't really, you know, been on podcasts telling that story. So you got the original, but um, uh, I haven't met anyone that's that uh, had uh, that kind of experience. It wasn't exactly advertised, right? You have to <laughs> you have to know somebody, but wow, is it thrilling? Oh, definitely. 
So, Rick, I think we pretty much come up to an end. Is there any projects or anything you want to promote? You know, I'm throwing off the mic to you. Do uh, anything you'd like to promote? Well, something that's related certainly to uh, our discussion. We we were fortunate enough uh, years ago to develop a relationship with the with the magazines that that are created by different publishers around the world um, that create a, a lifestyle magazine from uh, commissioned by car companies. So there's a Ferrari magazine. There's a there is a um, an, a uh, Bentley magazine, and so. Once the magazines are created, they're mailed to the people that have recently purchased a, uh, a new car by the manufacturer. So our team, uh, in almost every case, either is involved in some level or completely uh, was, was uh, the team that took over all the advertising sales in these publications. So um, it, was, it, was, it was a great, you know, sort of uh, uh, progression from my my days at rob report being in that business having my own company making those kinds of leads and it took it took a long time for us to be um getting those 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 uh you know sort of rights of of being able to promote our clients in those books because they're very competitive you know if you work for one company they certainly don't want to don't want to hire you uh to work for theirs but eventually we had the reputation of being able to uh bring in uh, luxury brands into the publication that match the the kind of uh, lifestyle that uh, that uh, works well with uh, with those car companies. And just recently, oh, probably a year or so ago, we got a call from a company that was building the the Bugatti magazine. So we got our our uh, our clients together, and and uh, you know within a matter of, of days or weeks, uh, sold out the publication. So it's. It's odd, and that's what we specialize in. It's really high-end audiences. So this is this is a book that's uh, I think it's a hundredth anniversary of Bugatti, and uh, gorgeous oversized publication, and it's being and it was mailed to all of the people that own Bugattis around the world, just a few just a few thousand of them, and um, you know ninety something percent are billionaires and multiple car owners. So it's the most uh, money on a, on a CPM, a cost per thousand of any advertising we've ever sold. It was literally hundreds of dollars per person to reach them for that, for that advertisement. And, um, that was, that was quite a thrill, but, uh, uh, you know, people talk about how prints evolved and this digital and print is dead, but, you know, tell me how else you're going to reach, uh, through an advertisement, all the people that own Bugattis around the world, right? Exactly. Jet manufacturers and and uh, resorts and cruise lines and all of those companies were very intrigued and interested in advertising with us. So that's 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 my pitch, if you will. So thank you for allowing that. Oh no, no problem there. But another maybe a little side note question to that. Um, now, did these publications, specific manufacturer publications, go directly to? only the original purchasers or do they, where they also offer to secondary or third their you know, second and third owners of the, these brands? Yeah, that's a great question. And a lot of people ask that question. Um, it is, it is, it, it, and, and people that own uh, those cars uh, have asked me too, Hey, I own a Ferrari. How come I don't get it? It, it has to be uh, a, a new purchase. Most of the companies, they decide so it can be different. Usually go back three years. So if you've purchased a car within the last three years, mm -hmm. uh, directly from a factory uh, uh, retail store, so a car dealer. So you would have had to purchase the Ferrari from, uh, you know, original brand new car registered under your name. If it's a second purchase, you're not going to be included in the list. The same with really all of the, 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 the uh, luxury and soda car publication. So, so you get the magazine. If sometimes it's an annual like Bugatti, sometimes it's a quarterly, sometimes it's two times a year, but you can only get it if you, um, you bought it new. And I, I had somebody the other day tell me that there are a few uh, Ferrari magazines that have appeared on eBay for sale or Amazon. And they literally go for for hundreds of dollars a, a copy, because they're rare. Because you yeah. you know we've asked uh, from time to time, hey, we have interest and we want 
to be able to send them out to somebody that's interested in advertising, so they want to see a copy. We don't have any left. So, no, I'm so a, the, the, well, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just, I was just going to finish by saying so. Not only is the car very rare, and 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 Ferrari, for example, um, never, maybe in history, but certainly since when we were talking with the CEO, doesn't advertise. So you can imagine uh, a product, a luxury product that's probably more well known or best known of any luxury company. Any kid from seven years old to you know eighty five, anyone knows what a Ferrari is, and they've never placed an ad. They have that much recognition. And uh, the magazine's just a byproduct, but created from Ferrari. Ferrari is the, the client. Now the publisher builds it, but the direction of uh, Ferrari with all these magnificent photographs and so forth uh, is worth, just the magazine itself is worth hundreds of dollars. Okay. Now, well, I'm sorry, I was going to say, I was just thinking that maybe this is the entrepreneurial spirit in me. And if you're not um, restricted by contractual obligations, was there a business opportunity possibly for you to offer like a reprint option for all those back issues? You know, if the manufacturers would allow it for any enthusiast to be able to purchase? Yeah, that's, you know what, that's, that's a good question. I mean, it wouldn't be something that, that I would be able to do. And, and, you know, the thing that I've tried to do throughout um, my, my career and certainly while I've had my businesses understand which which lines you can't cross and and be a good partner to somebody and respect their uh, position with with the client so i could recommend it to the the agency that actually builds the book we we don't we don't create the, the publication in this this arrangement uh we actually uh just just uh bring bring our clients on board for for advertisers but i'll bet that would sell a lot um you know the the thing about companies, especially Ferrari, is they they just feature um, they 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 focus on their publication for its customers. True. And anything that has to do with uh, the millions and millions of people around the world that just fantasize about owning a car, they don't really spend time and effort to to to, to deal with those things, right? Right. So you know they they probably would say no. Uh, if if it meant creating a product that we go to a list of people that are pre you know owners of uh of the ferrari that are second to third buyers i bet that that would be a that would appeal to them but uh yes entrepreneurial thinking at its finest that's a good idea you're welcome to have it and uh you know if you can make it you know, if it's something that helps you out you're more than happy to have it man that idea <laughs> that's right, just me right, thinking right, outside right. of the box but uh because i've seen i hear so many stories like different you know luxury car owners like you've probably seen the viral video from 10 years ago how the gentleman t drove his big Audi veyron into the lake you probably have seen the vi that viral video silver i actually i actually didn't but i'm, I'm certainly gonna look it up yeah Okay, so they had that thing. Turned out the, with the long story of the, as I guess the kids today will say, TLDR, the guy who owned it at the time that was pictured in the video, basically he was trying to commit insurance fraud, basically, and he got caught, got busted. Uh -huh. And then so this car ran out, changed hands a few times as people thought maybe they could rebuild it, it should be easy, blah, blah, blah. Literally didn't, didn't take it. Now enter in this gentleman who has an exotic rental car company in Las Vegas, a gentleman by the name of Houston Crosta, acquired it. And since he's owned a few Bugattis and gotten to the point where he's developed his own exhaust system for the cars, does his own maintenance since he's in the rental business. So he's whatever you can do to, you know, keep down on cost, even down to yeah. designing his own wheel. So he didn't have to be stuck with having to spend 40 grand for a new set of tires after end of life cycle after three or four, whatever the requirements were that Bugatti has. So yeah, he yeah. did that. And uh, he just recently, he's in the process of releasing a documentary of him literally putting this car back together, new paint job, everything that this car could be done. And it's like, some people said, yeah, but God, he's not going to sell you any of the parts that you need. 
but somehow he managed to find these parts, like a dealership going out of business, bought out their complete inventory. <laughs> so it's yeah. like, it's going to be interesting to see that documentary. But, you know, like you say, the reprints of the publication, I, I bet he would appreciate, uh, you know, a, a publication, a reprint of the Bugatti annuals or whatever you guys, the man Bugatti would call them or whatever. But that's just me. And those are the type of stories that are out there. So... I love those stories. I, I, I can go on YouTube and watch it on my TV for hours and hours and hours about the uh, restoration of cars and stories like that. Exactly. Okay, I think that's about wraps it up. And I want to thank you, Rick, for taking your time. And hopefully we can have you back on in the, the near future. I love it. Thank you for having me on. And uh, my pleasure in the future. I, I saved a couple of stories for episode two. Perfect. So. Thanks so much for thinking about me, and, and see you on Clubhouse soon, right? Or hear you, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, um, if ever, if you're listening to this podcast, I'll have links to my show, you know, all of my socials, including Clubhouse. I've got my own Clubhouse channel for gear vlogs. You guys can check that out. I do at least four shows a week on different uh, topic shows. You know, Mondays are my uh, car spotting, cars and coffee episode. Uh, tonight's episode, Wednesday, is going to be shop talk for independent shop owners or shop business owners, you know, B2B, you know, for them to share all sorts of stuff. And Thursday is my uh, automotive news uh, segment uh, topic room, you know, to interact with you, the audience, about latest uh, trends coming from the automotive industry. And usually Friday nights, who knows, I, I like to call my bench racing night, so just sit back. Crack open a cold one and let's just have some fun. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, that's you know it's, it's a fun business, isn't it? Yes, you it turn is. your passion into something uh, you're involved with uh, daily and, involved, and you know and share it with other people. It's uh, as part of uh, why I was excited to be on the show. Is just uh, you know hopefully people uh, will will listen and uh, and uh, you know take them back to the times where maybe they were interested in all of these. Uh, exotic and classic car stories and uh and uh, get a kick out of it so i i will see you uh i will see you on clubhouse i'll make it a point i think i follow your rooms but i'll follow them all and see when uh when i can uh, hop on and enjoy on stage definitely appreciate that rick all right and we're gonna be out in as they say as a friend of mine uh, jamie would say we're out in three two one Here are a few videos YouTube thinks you may enjoy. Be sure to follow me on all of my socials. So, crack open a cold one, sit back, relax, and have a blessed day.